forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Justice you will reign and every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. Oh, we trust the name of Jesus. If you would take this time and welcome those around you our service this morning. you took your time out this morning to come hang out with us and worship, and uh, we're glad you're here. And if everybody, when you came in, you should have got a packet, so everybody take out this connection card that's in your packet right now. I'm going to go ahead and invite you to fill this out while I'm talking. It's okay. Nobody listens anyway, so just go ahead and fill it out. Um, and what we're going to do, if this is your first time here, um, I'm going to ask you to fill out as much information as you feel comfortable putting on there. I'm not going to show up at your house unless it's dinner time and I like it, but, um, but I'm, we just want to mail you a gift as our way of saying thank you for being here with us, and I can't send you the gift if I don't have you at least your address, so um, you can put that on there. If you're a regular attender or a member, please put on your name and your email address at least because we have so much going on at our church, and we'll be able to stay on top of that with you and give that information to you. And then on the back, Go ahead and turn over to the back. There's all kinds of ways that you can get connected. Maybe you have some next steps. Maybe you need to join the church. Maybe you need to get baptized. There should have been an insert in everybody's packet today talking about baptism. And maybe that's you. You can put that on there and we'll follow up with you this week. Um, and there's a spot on the bottom for prayer requests. 
We have a lot going on in our church right now. We, we've had people this past week who have surgeries. We've had people who have been in the hospital. We have people who are, who are shut-ins. And I know just because of the crowd that's here, there's things that you might be going through as well that you would love to have somebody pray with you. Put that on there because the men of our church meet together every Tuesday morning and we just pour over these and lift them up to God. And there's nothing like having somebody from your church family knowing that they're praying for you as well throughout the week. So don't hesitate. Put that on there. We're going to pray for you. Um, and you can just drop these in the offering plate when they come by here in just a little bit. So you can fill that out while I'm giving the rest of the announcements. Does that sound like a good deal? All right. Well, good. All right. Glad for the response. So here's the deal. We have a lot going on. Um, we, first of all, we have a team from our church leaving for Guatemala this coming Sunday. There's 10 of us that are leaving, heading out for a missions trip. And I'm going to ask you to be praying for our team that it's going down there, um, that God will just move in our hearts, that we'll be impacted by that, but we'll be able to also show the love of Christ, support our missionaries, encourage them while we're there, and just watch and see what God's doing there and then bring that back here and be able to energize and excite our church for what God's doing, that he's doing there, he can also do here. And so be praying for our team. And we'll send out information this week on our Facebook page um, through emails with the names of everybody going so you can be putting some names with those that are going on this trip. And we just encourage you, please pray for that trip um, as we go out. Also, coming up in September, we have a lot going on. We have our grow groups, our small groups are starting up in September. And also what we call Kid Nation is starting up in September. What Kid Nation is, it's a Wednesday night program for our kids. And they're gonna, be, they're gonna be preparing and planning for a Christmas program they're gonna put on in December. And so Wednesday night at 6.30, uh, starting in September, you can drop your kids off here. We'll also have Bible studies going on for those who wanna be a part of that. Uh, but it's a great way for your kids to be surrounded by God's word even on a Wednesday night. And also be preparing to uh, tell the story of Christmas here for our church on a Sunday in December. I'm excited about that. And I know our kids are looking forward to that. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, if you'd like to serve in that, help serve with that, you can put that on the back of the card. We'll follow up with you. But that's gonna be a great thing starting in September. We have the small group starting. We have Kid Nation starting. We're also gonna be kicking off a family series. We're gonna talk about the family here on Sunday mornings. And I don't want you to miss that. So whether, what's, whatever stage of family you're in, whether you got kids in your, in your house, whether you're not even married or not, or maybe you're an empty nester and your kids are all grown, there's something for everybody um, in this series. And we're gonna walk through that in September. So don't miss in September. It's usually it's typically a time for people to go back to church anyway because the summer craziness has died down for a lot of people. But let's be intentional about that because I don't want you to miss out on that because I think God has something for everyone starting in September here at Morningstar, all right? If our ushers go ahead and come forward, we're gonna receive the offering today. And again, if you're a first time guest, all we ask that you put an offering plate is the connection card. But this is our way as regular attenders and members to give back to God and worship him in our giving. And you're like, well, I don't know how much do I give? Don't worry about that. Just what does God lay on your heart? What can you give? And because whatever comes in, we use to go and spread the gospel both here and around the world, and that's what we're all about. And so uh, it's our chance to give back to him and worship him in that, all right? So we're gonna worship God this morning. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for meeting with us here this morning, for this opportunity that we have to worship you with our singing, to worship you with our giving, to worship you and just encouraging one another by being here. But God, as we move through this, this time together this morning and we open up your word here in a moment, I pray that you would just impact the hearts of your people today. That God, all of us will leave here challenged, we'll leave here changed, we'll leave here more deeply in love with you than when we came in. Because we want to reach this area, this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it starts in our heart. So God, we pray that as we go through the rest of this time this morning, we make it all about you. We thank you for those that are here maybe for the first time. We thank you for those that have been here for years. But God, this morning it is all about you. It's all about your glory and your honor. And so we give that back to you this morning. Be with the rest of the time as we worship again, as we sing. Be with this offering as we receive it so we can, with our money and our treasure, show that, yes, we are committed to reaching this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. I will kneel in the dust at the foot of the cross where mercy paid for me where the wrath i deserved 
It is gone, it has passed, your blood has hidden me. Mercy, mercy, as endless as the sea, I'll see.
I will kneel in the dust at the foot of the cross where mercy paid for me. Amen. At this time, our kids can be dismissed um, to Kid City, and we're going to take a look um, at what the Bible says about mercy and take a look at Scripture this morning. Psalm 145, verses 8 through 9 says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. And his mercy is over all that he has made.
Father, Lord, we praise you in this place for who you are. Lord, we praise you that when we were broken, you came and you restored us and you made us whole and you decided to use us in spite of who we were. Lord, we praise you for giving us the opportunity to be your vessel. Lord, we ask that it would be to our desire that the world would see your grace and your mercy in our lives, Lord, and we would be vessels of that and not vessels of chaos or hatred or unkindness, but we'd be vessels of the love that we've been shown. Lord, we love you. We praise you and ask that today would be a great day in your house. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated this morning, church. Amen. Well, once again, good morning. I'm so glad that you're here. And there's an announcement that I forgot to make, and I'm so sorry, so I'm going to do it now. But on September the 8th, which is a couple Sundays from now, we're going to have our church picnic. And it's going to be an amazing time for us just to relax and hang out and encourage one another. We have a gigantic slip and slide uh, for kids or adults, whoever would like to take part in it. It's huge. Uh, we've got, we'll have a wiffle ball field cut in the grass back there. We can play some pickup games of wiffle ball and uh, fishing in the pond. We'll provide the hamburgers and hot dogs. Everybody just bring a side and or dessert, depending on how much you'd like to eat. And uh, horseshoes and just everything's going to be going on. And it's just a chance for us to relax. There's no running anything. We're just going to go hang out and have a good time from 1230 to about 3 o'clock on September the 8th. So put it on your calendars. Don't miss church. Make sure you're here uh, because I want to beat you in wiffle ball. So other than that, it's going to be fun, okay? Uh, the other thing is, like, we got so many of our college students that are getting ready to start school this week, um, and we got some that are going to be leaving, and I know uh, Lauren Keeley is getting ready to fly off to Arizona this coming week, and the Keeleys have been with us for a while now, and that's a big deal, so pray for mom and dad. That's a long way away, Arizona, uh, but uh, we're excited for Lauren, for sure. And, and we have a lot more. So pray for our college students. That's a big deal. Uh, going into uh, that time of life, that season of life, is a lot going on. So And pray for moms and dads because it's expensive and it's worrisome. And we're just going to pray for everybody on that, okay? Uh, if you've got your Bibles, go to John chapter 13 this morning. John chapter 13. You can see we, we have it set up this morning to observe the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do that at the end of the message today. And I'm excited about that. You know, the church has been given two ordinances. One is baptism, and the other one is Lord's Supper, and they're not sacraments. Don't ever use the word sacrament to describe those because that means that there's part of your salvation. It's part of going to heaven, and these two things have nothing to do with that. But they are commanded. Baptism is commanded as a picture of what Christ has done for us, us identifying with the church and with Christ, and the Lord's Supper is us remembering what Jesus did and looking back. And I'm excited about that. And today we're going to dive into it and actually learn a little bit about what that means and, and what that looks like and why we do that. So the question then becomes, so you're sitting down for supper at your house. What are you going to talk about? What do you talk about at dinner table at your house? If it's anything like our house, it's crazy, right? Um, this is not a dinner time conversation, but I want to share with you because it was funny and it happened this week. So Mason is in um, second grade, and he comes home from school on Friday, and the side of his face is all scratched up, and his ear is all scratched up, and it's like all down here, like a, like a road rash type thing on the side of his face. And we're talking, I'm like, Mason, what happened to your face? Which is a weird conversation to have to have with your seven-year-old, but it happens. So what happened to your face? And he's like, gets upset, like, I don't want to tell him I get in trouble. I'm like, well, no, you're not going to get in trouble, but I want to know. Well, if I tell him I get in trouble, and it's that conversation, parents, you know, you're like, you're going to get in trouble if you don't tell me, type thing. And he goes, well, I was on the rock wall. I guess they have a little rock wall for the kids to climb. And my friend Robbie was there, and I told him to push me off. But I didn't know I was going to land on my face. And he just starts crying. I'm like, okay. And it's like, oh, man, of course he has School photos coming up this week. It was great. It's a good conversation. It's wonderful. I'm laughing. Manny's upset because school photos are coming and our kids are like, he got road rash on his face. It's good. Anyway, like, what, like, why would you ask your friend to push you off the rock wall? I didn't know it was going to land on my face. Okay, well, now you know. So don't do that again. Like, these, I didn't know it was going to shock me if I put my finger in the light socket type conversations, right? So, anyway, it's fun. But that's kind of how our table conversations a lot of times go. Maybe yours is a little different. But a lot of times there's a lot of arguing at our family dinners over who's going to get seconds. Our boys like to eat. So if any of you would ever like to adopt one of our boys for a meal, you're welcome to do so. Like, you don't have to invite the whole family. Just invite one of them. Like, it'd be great. 
for our budget. It'd be awesome. Because they just, it's like we eat and I'm barely done eating and they're grabbing food. Especially like our family, don't judge me. We love gluten, okay? <laughs> and we love bread. If you're one of those anti-gluten people, I'm sorry. But that's just, we love bread and we have bread with a lot of our meals. And we don't just have bread, like we do it right. Like we cut the loaf and we spread butter on it and we put garlic on it and parsley. You know what I'm saying? Like Anne's like, give me a thumbs up. And we toast it in the oven and we cut it in slices and the boys just grab handfuls of it and put it on their plate. And when there's one piece left, like there's forks and knives flying at our dinner table because like it's a, like they're fighting over dinner, they're fighting over seconds. We're hearing what happened at their school. At some point it dives into the boys making fun of Mandy about how she says certain things, which is always a, a fun time at our table uh, because it's funny just the way that uh, they, they like to tease their mom in a loving way. They love their mom and they like to say, make fun of the way she says things. Right, Daniel and Jonathan? Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. So, so, but here's the deal. So you're sitting at dinner table, what are you gonna talk about? What if it's your last meal, okay? Like, what if it's your last, not because you're convicted of a crime, but what if it's your last, like, you know going into that meal, it's the last time you're ever gonna sit down with your family and your friends, what are you gonna talk about then? What are you gonna do then? Kind of changes the dynamics just a little bit on that. So what are you, what are you going to do? You're with your friends and with your family. The last time you ever sit down with them, what conversation are you gonna have? And this is what we're talking about this morning. We're looking at John chapter 13, and we're talking about the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, which they're celebrating Passover. They're in the upper room. Jesus is going into this meal, and he knows this is the last meal he's going to have with these guys before he's crucified. Literally, a couple hours from now, he's arrested and beaten and nailed to a cross. So this is it. He knows this. So what conversation is he going to have? Well, let me tell you the conversation the disciples have. They go into the upper room and you know what conversation they're having? Like they're sitting down to dinner. Jesus is wanting this to be a super serious, intimate moment. And they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. They're arguing about who's going to be the best. Like Peter going, you know, it's going to be me because I'm the most outspoken. And John's like, no, it's, you know, it's me because Jesus loves me more. And, and Matthew going, no, I'm the smartest out of all you fools. Like, you know, it's going to be me. And these guys are going, all 12 of them. Like, who's going to be the greatest? Who's the best? They're still thinking that Jesus is getting ready to set up an earthly kingdom. Now, don't get me wrong. One day he will. But that's not what he was here to do that time. And imagine that frustration that Jesus must have felt. He goes into this room, and he's wanting to have this super intimate moment, and his guys are griping and arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Sounds like a conversation at our table, right? So we're looking at this Lord's Supper. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all cover this time frame. All of them talk about this last supper with his disciples. But John goes even deeper. John tells us, uses two chapters to tell us the words that were actually said. A lot of the conversation. Matthew and Mark and Luke, they cover the actual Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread and the blessing it and the drinking of the wine and the blessing it. They cover that, but John covers all the conversation. And it's very interesting to give you kind of an insight into how that's possible, why John does that. They're sitting around this table, which is not like what we would think about, like a high top table with chairs. They didn't sit in chairs. They reclined. And usually they would lean on their left arm, and there would be like a pillow or something to prop themselves up on. And they would lean into the table area, and then they would kind of go around the table like that, everybody leaning on their left side. John, what we find out, John is right in front of Jesus. The Bible says he's able to actually put his head back on the, the chest of Jesus in this Last Supper. So John hears everything Jesus says. John also hears the conversation of everybody else. So John uses two chapters to report everything else that goes on. And it's such an amazing insight into this Last Supper. So they sit down to this supper and Jesus, who's about to go to the cross for them, gets up from the table in the middle of their conversation of who's going to be the greatest. He gets up from the table and he grabs a basin and he fills it with water. He takes a cloth and he goes around this table where these disciples are gathered, laying on their left side. And he starts to wash their feet. Amazing. Why? That's a crazy thing for him to do. He's the Messiah. He's about to die. He's about to give his life. But before he does that, he gives his pride. Like he is so humble. 
that he kneels at the feet of these disciples who are arguing about who's the best. And he kneels down and he wipes and cleanses their feet. Nasty feet. Like, they're not wearing shoes. (laughs) They're walking on dirt roads. They're stepping and stuff all over the place. Filthy. But our Savior takes the time and takes water and a basin and he wraps a towel around himself and he kneels down and he starts to wash their feet. Look in John chapter 13. This is amazing. Verse 4. So he got up from supper and he laid aside his robe and he took a towel and he tied it around himself and next he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. And he came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Now that's interpreted, Peter saying, what are you doing? (laughs) Like this is not the role of the Messiah. This is not the role of... Uh, we've, already, we've already established that you're, you're God's son. We already believe that you're the Messiah in flesh. You're God among us. You're Emmanuel. This is not your job. That's what Peter's telling him. Like, what are you doing? And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but afterwards you will know. Look at Peter. You will never wash my feet, ever, Peter says. Peter's, it's, a, it's a humble thing. Peter's like, I don't want you to do Like, this is not your job. Like one of us should have stepped up and done this. You shouldn't have to do this. But Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head also. This is an amazing picture. And we might miss it if we don't understand something. So forgive the side note, okay? But I want us to understand something. Under the law of Moses, when a priest were consecrated to minister to the Lord, They would wash their feet was the first ordinance done after the entering the tabernacle. Before they ever went to the altar, they would have their feet washed. Someone would kneel down and wash their feet. And then after they had their feet washed, we find that in Exodus chapter 30 and Exodus chapter 40. And toward the end of the consecration, they went in to eat the flesh of the sacrifice. So the sacrificial lambs that people would bring in to offer, the priest would be able to eat some of that. And they would eat the sacrificial meat. And then they would eat bread from the basket of consecration in Exodus chapter 29 and Leviticus chapter 8. That's an amazing thing when you understand the Lord's Supper and what he was doing with his disciples in the upper room. He was taking these disciples, these fishermen and tax collectors and outcasts, and he was washing their feet. One, he was serving them, but also he was showing them, hey, soon there's no more priest thing going on. You don't have to go to a tabernacle. You don't have to go to a temple to worship. Like, I'm going to come in and dwell in you. And he's consecrating them by washing their feet. And then in a moment, he's going to take the bread and he's going to break the bread. And he's going to offer them to eat. And he's going to offer them the drink. And it's all going back to the Old Testament. When they were in, 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 in Egypt, and that night, the Passover, the very meal they're, they're celebrating, where God said, I want you to take a lamb, a pure lamb, and you're going to kill it, and you're going to take the blood, and with the blood, you're going to spread it on the outside of your doorpost, and you're going to go in, and you're going to eat that meal, and you're going to drink, and you're going to be ready with your shoes on your feet, ready to leave. And that night, the Spirit of the Lord dwell, it, it, it came, and it passed over the land of Egypt. And anybody who had the blood on their doorpost, the Spirit of the Lord passed over that house. And everybody in the house was saved. But those who didn't have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, their firstborn was killed that night. And Jesus, by doing this, he's showing them so lovingly. He could have he just called them out and yelled at them about arguing about who's the greatest. But so lovingly, he washes their feet. And then he shares this meal with them, showing them that I am that lamb. That's me. I am the perfect sacrifice. What was done in the Old Testament was a shadow of what was going to happen and be fulfilled in me. I'm the perfect sacrifice. It's amazing we understand the foot washing and Lord's Supper in light of that. Then Jesus speaks of betrayal. In chapter 13, verses 18 through 21, he talks about that somebody in that very room, somebody whose feet he just washed, was going to betray him. And then later on in the Garden of Gethsemane, before his arrest, that night, just a few hours later, Jesus speaks of denial. That somebody in the group that just shared the meal with him was going to deny him. So Jesus speaks of betrayal and denial. There have been some recently, some very high-profile people in ministry recently that have publicly either walked away from their faith or publicly called into serious question their belief and their faith. 
Some of you might not be aware of that, but it's, it's, it's because they've been in ministry for a long time, because they're high-profile people. They put it out there on social media and other places that they're walking away from their faith or they no longer believe what they used to believe or they're seriously struggling with what they believe. But I want us to understand something this morning, church. People walking away from their faith is nothing new. This is not a new phenomenon. Now, with social media and, and, and access to instant information, it's more out there and in your face, but it's definitely not new. I want you to find it's all part of this Last Supper passage, but do you understand that the very first high-profile person to walk away was one of the very ones who followed Jesus, was one of the original 12, and we know his name. And in fact, his name is used now to refer to someone who's a traitor, it's Judas. In fact, if somebody hurts you, if somebody betrays you, if somebody sells out, we call them a Judas, don't we? In fact, if you look it up in the Urban Dictionary, um, Judas, it obviously tells Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, but it also says, and also used as a, to name a traitor. It's a nickname we give to somebody who sold us out. We use it as a nickname to call someone who's stabbed us in the back. For almost 2,000 years, his name has been synonymous with somebody who betrays. But yet, he was one of the original 12. The second high-profile person to deny their faith was another one of the 12. It was Peter. The betrayer and the denier both walked with Jesus for three years. Now, Judas, he didn't take part in the Last Supper. He actually left before the meal. He sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And we don't look, we, we try to wrap around, how could somebody who followed Jesus go and sell him out? Who knows? I, we don't know. Maybe the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders got to Judas and convinced him that what Jesus was doing was, was, bad for, was bad for religion, bad for God, bad for Israel, and he bought into it. We know that he was bitter afterwards because he tried to give the money back, and he went out and hung himself. But that was a very public betrayal, wasn't it? He brought Jesus' arresters and his accusers into the garden where Jesus was at, and he betrayed him publicly. Peter, later that night, while Jesus was being tried, he was out there warming himself by the fire, and somebody came up to him and said, hey, you're one of his followers. And Peter said, no, I'm not. And again, so, yes, I, I've seen you with them. Peter, no, I'm not, very publicly in this courtyard. Went so, as far, so far as wanted to make sure he was dis distancing himself from Jesus that the last time they asked him, he swore. He said words that no follower of Christ would ever say to make sure people knew he had nothing to do with Jesus. But he's another follower. He was one of the 12. The betrayer and the, the, the denier both walked with Jesus for three years. They both heard the same messages. They both heard the same theology. They both spent day and night with the Son of God in the flesh. So how can that be? How can on this night, like after three years, on this night is the night that he's betrayed and the night that he's denied? When things like this happen and people walk away from their faith so publicly, when people abandon their faith, especially in such a public way, we tend to start pointing fingers. We're especially guilty of pointing fingers against anything that goes against one of our personal convictions or preferences. As our way of saying, see, that's why that will never happen to me. I, that's why I'll never do that. Like, I don't smoke. That's why I'll never walk away from Jesus. I, I don't drink. That's why I'll never walk away from Jesus, right? I don't listen to contemporary Christian music. I don't go to a church that has drums on the stage. I've actually heard that one before. So I'm never going to walk away from the faith. I don't go to a church where my pastor wears shorts on the stage to preach in, so I, I'm never going to walk away from the faith. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't use certain Bible translations, so I'm never going to walk away. I've heard them. We point our fingers at these people, like, well, see, they walk away, but I'm never going to do that because I do this or I do that. But what about these two guys? See, there's no preference or style of music or way they dressed. It's not because of tattoos or hairstyles or whatever we can point to. It's none of that because these two guys walked and talked and were mentored personally by Jesus himself, by God in the flesh <laughs> every day. It wasn't like they went and hung out with him for a couple days a week and went back home. They camped out with him. 
They were with him through some hard times, through some good times. They saw some amazing things, all 12 of them. Jesus constantly pouring into them, and yet they walked away. They had the best theology, the best teacher, the best model, the best everything, yet still publicly they either betrayed him or they denied him. Oh, and by the way, the other 10 abandoned him too, so we can't, like, they don't get off the hook either because they all scattered and ran away. We just get the other two because they actually verbally said and did things. The other 10 just disappeared. One of them came back after he was crucified and hung out at the cross, but they all scattered. We set up celebrities and we idolize Christian leaders. We gotta be very careful about this because even for me, I read everything I get my hands on. I'm just, I like to read. I enjoy reading. I've got tons of books in my office, and that's not enough for me. So Manny the other day said, hey, you might want to go to the library and go study this week because there's a lot going on. I'm like, if I go to the library, that's going to be more distracting for me. If I'm like, Because then I start, oh, that book looks really cool, and I'll just read the whole thing. But I read, but here's what i got to be careful of. Because I can, I, it's very hard, it's very easy for me to start reading a lot from a certain person, and that person's not bad. they got great theology. But I can start becoming more of a disciple of that person than I am a disciple of Christ. And what has happened in our Western culture, we started to idolize certain spiritual leaders and we start becoming more a disciple of that person than we are a disciple of Christ. Now, it's not wrong to read. And I encourage you, read, challenge yourself, but we gotta be very careful because we can do the same thing. Am I a disciple of Christ or am I a disciple of whoever I'm reading? And I want us to see something. The answer to this question, why do people walk away? How do we wrap our heads around that? I love this. This is so cool. And we might miss this, but here's the deal. John covers the Last Supper in John chapter 13 and John chapter 14. Two chapters. 69 verses. From John 13 and John 14 in 69 verses, Jesus does most of the talking. And he uses personal pronouns at least 111 times. Jesus talks about himself at least 111 times in 69 verses. He uses words I, my, and mine at least 111 times. 69 verses. That means every verse has 1.6 references of Jesus referencing himself. I thought that was amazing. As I looked through that, I'm like, man, there's a lot of I's in there. There's a lot of my's and mine's in there. So I just started counting. Like, what in the world? It's two chapters. You have to go from John chapter 1 to almost John chapter 8 to get the same amount from Jesus. But in two chapters, he's like 111 times, I, mine, and mine. What I'm saying is, is Jesus' last meal, this last dinner conversation with his closest guys, he makes it all about himself. It's painfully clear that what Jesus is doing here, he's making it about him. Then he goes on in John chapter 15. They've left the upper room. They're walking to the garden, and I'm guessing they're passing some some trees because Jesus says in chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. Then in verse um, 4, he says, Remain in me, and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. Verse 5, he repeats the same phrase, I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing. You need to underline that word nothing, highlight it, mark it, star it, because he says, because you can do nothing without me. I love that. He says in John 15, 4, remain in me. That Greek word is meno. Remain. You gotta be a part of this. And then he says, remain in me. Underline that word in because he doesn't say remain near me. He doesn't say remain um, uh, with me. He doesn't say remain under me. He says remain in me. In me. Because he says, I am the source of your life. See, we elevate Christian leaders and we elevate certain preachers and certain things and what happens is We become a disciple of them. And Jesus says, you're the branch, but our branch ends up looking like this. It's dry. It's empty. 
Jesus says, I'm, I'm the vine, and you're the branch. And if we remain in Christ, what that means is he's the trunk of the tree. The trunk is what pulls, the, pulls the, the moisture and the things from the roots and transports it to the vines and to the branches. The sap that's flowing is from the vine itself, from the trunk. We're the branch. And there's a big difference in a branch that is abiding in Christ and a branch that stays near Christ. There's a difference in the branch that is in Christ, consumed by Christ. Christ is the source of everything in our life and a branch that just stays with Christ. There's a lot of people that are with Christ. Yeah, I'm not anti-Christ. I'm not against Christ. He's a good guy. There's even a lot of believers. Like, I, I like staying close to him because I like going to church. Like, but I'm just, I'm with him, but I'm not in him. Does that make sense? There's a big difference in the two. One, there's no substance. It's hollow. It withers away. One is vibrant and full of life. And when you separate out the branch from the trunk or from the vine, it ends up looking like this. I would have loved to bring the tree in, but I couldn't carry it in by myself today. So this is all you get. But you guys understand what I'm saying? That this is, this is what it looks like when we're in Christ. We're fruitful, like we talked about last week in James that our life and everything about us is coming from Christ, our very existence, our very life, our very hope, our joy, everything. It's in Christ. It's not near Christ. I think we have a lot of near Christians. We know a lot of people who are in Christ. We talk about this idea, how can people walk away? When, where people, when we mess up as we start thinking that we're the vine. Where people start walking away and abandoning their faith or walking away from it is we've lost sight of who's the vine and who's the branch. Jesus says twice, I am the vine, I am the trunk, you're the branch. But what we like to do is say, well, I know, like, I know you're the trunk and it's all about you, but I can do this. I can handle this. And again, we're not, we're not against Jesus. We're like, well, like you, you're doing a good job being the vine, but I can do that too. And that's how people end up walking away. We confuse who's the vine and who's the branch. Where people fall and abandon their faith is we try to replace Jesus as the vine. When in reality, I'm supposed to be an outpouring of Jesus. Not Jesus being an outpouring of me. I'm supposed to be, as we talked about last week, performing Christ, an outpouring of Jesus, the source of life that is in me. He made so clear 111 times in two chapters that it's all about him. And things go crazy when we get this turned upside down, when we flip the script on that, when we elevate certain people in our life over elevating Christ in our life. And it might not be the bad, the person might not be bad. They might be really awesome and a great speaker and a great theologian. But if we're elevating them instead of elevating Christ, then we're removing ourselves from the vine. It's very easy to get discouraged when we see such high profile people walk away or publicly declare that they're no longer following Christ. But see, if I'm connected to the vine and the trunk, I'm okay. I'm okay. And so are you. So we pray for them. Two of Jesus' very followers, one betrayed him, one denied him, the rest scattered. We're not above turning our backs either. So we pray, and we pray hard, and we lift them up, and we make sure that we're connected to the vine. So a couple things this morning I want us to get. We're talking about recommitting, because we're about to observe the Lord's Supper. And we want to recommit this morning a couple things before we take part in such an amazing remembrance. There's a couple things we want to recommit to. And the first thing we want to recommit to this morning is to Christ. To Christ. Jesus says, and we'll look at this in a minute when we observe the Lord's Supper. He says, do this in remembrance of me. It's all about him. He's the Passover lamb for us. That if we are in Christ and we are in the blood of Christ, that the wrath of God passes over us and we are now grafted into the family of God and we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ and get to spend an eternity with God in heaven. 
and we have a source for our life now. We've got to recommit to Christ. That's why he's talked about being the vine and that we're the branch. Do everything in remembrance of me. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. He says, and he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We've got to recommit to Christ. The second thing we need to recommit to is each other. To each other. What do I, what do I mean by that? Jesus talks about remembering him. And Jesus showed us about serving others. That our Savior, the God of the universe, the creator of everything, washed feet. You say, well, how do we serve others? Are you saying I got to wash people's feet? No, no, no. It would be great, but no. What I'm saying is, what are we doing sacrificially for the person sitting next to you in this building? As brothers and sisters in Christ, how are we serving one another? Because Jesus said, those outside these walls are going to know you're my disciple by the love you have one for another. So how are we serving? And sometimes it gets dirty. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it might take time away from your family. Sometimes it might take up dinner time. Sometimes it might take up sleeping time. Sometimes it might take up your energy and everything about you. Sometimes it might take up some money. Whatever that looks like, how are we serving one another? We've got to recommit to Christ and we've got to recommit to remembering him and we've got to recommit to one another. And part of that also is the church. It's not the building, it's the body of believers that are in here. We've got to make sure we're here together on Sunday encouraging one another. We've got to make sure we're signing up for small groups to go even deeper in the word of God and challenge and provoke one another to good works. Don't, don't neglect the assembling of ourselves together. Listen, parents, we've got to set a priority for our kids that God is everything and we're going to love his church as much as he loved the church, which he died and gave himself for it. So we got to recommit to Christ, remember who he is, make sure we're connected to the vine, and we got to recommit to one another and start serving one another. How are you serving the person in the row with you? How are you serving the person across the room from you? How are we serving? Recommitting to one another because Jesus says, as often as you do this, as often as you observe the Lord's Supper, as often as you get together, do this in remembrance of me. What an amazing, amazing time that must have been in the upper room. So com conflicting for Jesus who loves these guys but knows that one's going to betray and one's going to deny and the rest are going to scatter. But still, in the moment of all of that, and him wrestling with this in himself, because we see that when he goes to the garden, but still loving and serving and wanting to teach and show them what this all was about. Church, we've got to recommit. The best way to protect ourselves from walking away is recommit to Christ and recommit to one another. And we're going to have a chance to do that. Let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. I want to give a time of response this morning. But this time of response, because we're observing the Lord's Supper, is going to be a little different than other times of responses because this is a big deal. Paul talks about this in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, he talks about how he gives us some guidelines on taking this. He says, be careful that you don't have division or unsettled disagreements among you. He says in verse 17, now in giving the following instruction, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, I hear you come together as a church. There are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. There must indeed be factions among you so that the approved among you may be recognized. Paul says there's some division. There's some people not getting along. There's some, we would call them cliques or groupings in your church. And one is not agreeing with the other. They all have different ideas of what to do and how to do it. Paul says, stop it. He even says in verse 30 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that there are some that are sick and dying among you because you guys are taking part in this Lord's Supper, remembering Christ, and you're doing it unworthily. Then he says in verse 27, therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of the sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Listen to me very carefully with your heads bowed and eyes closed. So a man 
should examine himself. In this way, he should eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Paul says, evaluate yourself. And maybe this morning, before we take part in this as a family, maybe there's some forgiveness that you need to offer. Maybe there's a grudge you're holding on to. Well, you don't understand. They haven't asked for forgiveness. That's okay. That's not what forgiveness is about anyway. Maybe there's some sin in your life that you're just, you just need to ask God this morning. God, I want to take part in this. I want to remember you. I want to recommit to you, but I got, you've got to forgive me. Please forgive me. Maybe there's somebody you're not getting along with. It's time to let it go. It's time to stop holding on to that. This morning, in just a moment, I'm going to stop talking and we're going to spend a few moments of self-reflection because it's all about him. He's the vine, we're the branches. And we're commanded to present our bodies a living sacrifice. So let's make sure we are coming to this time with a humble heart and a servant's heart towards Christ and others and to remember. To remember. Maybe this morning some of you just need, we just need to recommit to the vine. Recommit to Christ. Maybe we just need to recommit to one another. I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to worship. And this is that time. Self-reflection. Let's examine our own hearts. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your truth. God, we thank you for this time this morning. Well, it's uncomfortable to evaluate ourselves. We don't like it. It hurts sometimes. But God, you desire that relationship with us. So God, whatever it is that's blocking that relationship in our own lives, whatever that's hindering our fellowship with you, God, this morning, I pray that you'll tear down those walls, that you'll humble us, that we'll seek forgiveness from you. We'll give forgiveness in our heart for others that we might be withholding. So that, God, when we partake and we take part in this remembrance, you're glorified and you're honored because we recommit to you, we recommit to one another as we look back on what you did for us. God, work in the hearts of your people this morning. Bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and worship with me?